everybody who's on the, at the top here. Hi, I guess I'm going to jump right in here. Um, I'm Amelia, California Relief. And I'm not sure what you guys talked about in your discussions group because I wasn't in one, but um, we're going to be transitioning to our kind of our opening message. And I just wanted to give a, a little preface to, you know, one of the, 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 the richness of the network retreat, the network in general is the diversity and collection of, of you know, work that we do, the geography, our education, you know, it represents all, a lot of different approaches um, to urban forestry. And, uh, and truly there's an openness to outside messages. You know, we've been able to work our way, maneuver through to get to, to this point where we are now. And the retreat is this one time when we come together and we're able to communicate. And, you know, we're not in person, but we've kind of learned how to how to adjust to that. And um, and historically, the opening comments at the network retreat have been like an outside voice, like someone who we never have heard from that provides us with a perspective that gives us a new vocabulary and, a, and kind of um, empowers us to look at our jobs a little bit differently and that we're not alone in what we do and that we're connected to a lot of uh, um, you know, the, the earth and, and other, uh, the other jobs out there. And so I wanted to have an opening message that kind of related to how I felt sitting in my office, looking out my window, you know, things that I didn't do back when I was out you know, tree planting a lot and, and kind of reintroducing me um, to the great world outside and the, the trees and the plants but with a new appreciation after we've gone through what we've been through in the last year. I know we, you know, we continue what we were doing, but under you know, we have all these restrictions and things that have changed the way we do our work. And so I had an interesting conversations with, I, I'll just say this is funny, with a mat and three cats. I don't know how I did that, but um, I, I wanted to go into the ethnobotany and, and a little bit about um, uh, traditional ecological knowledge and, and through conversations with um, Kat, uh, Super Fisky, who's on our board, um, we were able to connect with um, connect with Matt uh, Tutimas from the Gabrielino um, mission, and and had some really great conversations. And I just was I'm hoping um, that the energy that that we got through those conversations conversations was I was able to share that with the network. And so we're going to have Matt's going to share with us. He's going to tell his story, and I'm hoping that this will be a way that we, we can have new knowledge, new information that can be, can come into our hearts and minds. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Matt, and then um, he's going to present to us for a while, and then Kat is going to come in and and kind of guide us into our um, breakout session questions and kind of pull in. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt's message with with um, urban forestry. So Matt, I am going to Oh, hello. Thank you so much, Amelia. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm sorry, are you able to see my, let me try and do this one. Can we all see the screen now? Is that being shared? Let's see. Yeah, yes, we, we can see your screen. Okay. So I can't see you all. How do I? No, you asked. All right. How do I see you all? <laughs> you all, you're, you're just gonna see you for now. I'm just gonna see, okay, perfect. No worries then. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Tutimez. Uh, I'm the son of John Tutimez. Uh, elder of the Keech Gabileno. Um, I'm also the nephew of our chief, Chief Ernie Salas Tutimez, and cousin to our tribal chairman, Andy Salas. I thank you so much for uh, providing this opportunity to speak about some of our tribe's uh, knowledge regarding the uh, uh, our landscape and the native flora and fauna that we have been gifted with uh, here. And so uh, today I've been asked just to discuss some of our traditional ecological knowledge. Now, this isn't knowledge that is shared amongst all tribes. This is specific to us and um, our tribe. And, but first, uh, before we start off, um, I always start off with a, a prayer from my uncle. And, and here's our, my uncle, uh, Chief Ernie. He actually just passed away January 19th of this year. 
uh, it's a huge difference for us. It's a it's a very uh, significant loss for us because he was the holder of, of this knowledge I'm going to be sharing today, um, him as well as some of our other elders, uh, but mainly my uncle was my main source. And so uh, today is dedicated to him uh, and what he has taught me and what I'm going to share with you today. But right now, I'd like to um, uh, give honor to our creator and to uh, bless this time that we are together. So thank you. Let us pray to the four directions, the east, the south, the west, norte. The east represents the light of wisdom, illumination, freshness, peace, and understanding. From the south comes the power of life brutality, growth, and warmth. From the west represents of maturity, autumn, rain, snow, thunder, and also death, or the quality of things coming to an end. And from the north, comes the cold purifying winds, the cleansing of austerity, the strength of endurance, and the white snows and hairs of old age. Nawija, Aok, Anek, Tamik, Kwata, Tayai, Hanuka, Aho. I thank you for that. So what we're going to discuss today is wisdom of our elders. And this is a concept that uh, my uncle shared with all of us. And many of our elders have shared with us a lot of this traditional ecological knowledge that is inherent within our families. And this isn't something that, you know, uh, we've learned from books or that we've, you know, uh, uh, sort of studied elsewhere. This is just the knowledge that comes from our family. And, and what I'm showing you right now are members of our tribe from the past, our elders who have passed on. Uh, in this particular, this is my uncle on to the right, and uh, uh, one of our elders, Alex, who his grandmother is Felitas uh, Serrano, Felicitas, where she was actually one of the informants for some of the old Harrington and, and Krober and all those folks. Uh, our elders have provided us. Here's uh, Grandma Fina with uh, B. Alva. B. Alva was actually one of the original. Uh, um, uh, uh, she was uh, in the play The Ramona, and she was one of the original cast members of that play. And she's actually uh, from the tribe uh, and one of our great leaders of the past from the 50s and 60s. Um, and then we have Vicky Duarte in the black here, and then my tia. Virginia on the left, and Vicky Duarte, if you've heard the city of Duarte, um, after their family. Uh, these are all the components that are from our tribe, and this is the information from all these families that I'm going to be providing you today, and our main uh, uh, information source being my uncle. And now here's one of the main concepts that my uncle teaches us, and the reason I'm showing you pictures of our human elders is because what I'm going to speak about today is not so much about our human elders. Here's a concept that my uncle uh, always taught us. In our origin story, humans were actually placed on this earth after the plants and animals. So the plants and animals were placed on the earth prior to humans. Therefore, plants and animals are older than us. There are elders and elders are meant to be learned from. We are meant to, to, to be taught from them. And that's one concept that we hold true, that we are still learning from our, our elders being the plants and animals. Why, think about this, why in all of our stories are the main characters always animals or even plants? That sort of concept is the reality to us being, because in our mindset, these gifts, these creations that were provided to us are there to teach us, there to give us knowledge. Now, I want to go over just real quick about who we are. 
and our uh, tribal territory about where we come from. And if you look at this map, this is a map of, of uh, the traditional territory of the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians being Keech Nation. Our territory went from the Santa Monica Mountains, pretty much from Malibu Creek in the north, went all the way through Santa Clarita area, all the way back into the mountains into uh, um, uh, uh, Joat, which is uh, Mount Baldy, and all the way back into uh, the San Bernardino Valley, which is over by Yucaipa. And then it flows down Yucaipa all the way into the Santa Ana Mountains and exits out towards uh, Dana Point, which is uh, Aliso Creek. And then out west towards all the Channel Islands. And the Channel Islands, were a main component of the culture of the Gabrielino folk. And here's one, uh, I guess, reason why the islands were accessible by our folks. And, and here's one of the other concepts that my uncle always taught us and that I'm gonna share with you, is the idea that the resources, the resources that we've already been provided on our land, much like the trees that we're gonna be discussing today, the resources are what defines our culture. And here's one quick example of how one resource that occurred in our, our landscape helped to define our culture. And the definition or the ability allowed us to interact with these channel islands. Now think about this. There are only two maritime cultures within Southern California, two cultures that use these islands, ours and the Chumash up north. Chumash used the Northern Channel Islands, we use the Southern Channel Islands. However, why weren't there other coastal uh, Indians using those islands? Why? Because they weren't maritime cultures. Why? Because they did not have one specific resource in their landscape. And what was that resource? Oil, asphaltum. If you look, oil and asphalt, oil, just natural oil, only occurs, or tar, or brea, whatever you want to call it, only occurs within our tribal territory and the Chumash tribal ter territory. We were the only two tribes to be able to make waterproof plank boats to be able to access the ocean, to be able to make seafaring boats, to have a maritime culture. So because of the gifts that were provided to us by the creator, that's what helped to pretty much facilitate all the activities that we did that helped define the culture. And that's what I'm gonna be explaining about today are some of the elements of trees that help to define our culture and how we utilize them. Because all of these items, and, and this is the, the other concept that my uncle always taught us, is that the, the plants and animals, that they are gifts, gifts of our creator. We think of them as natural resources and thing, and resource, that is a, a proper name. And for us, they're gifts because a gift is something that you don't create yourself. It's something that's given to you, that, that you are provided for your benefit. And these gifts, they're meant to be shared, you know, with our surrounding brothers and sisters. That's how the, the trade component, that's how, you know, bartering started is because it wasn't so much that you had to trade because you had to take care of your family or you had to make some sort of sustenance for yourself. Oh, no. All of our food, all of our medicine, all of our shelter was provided by the creator. So with all these gifts, you then shared them with your brother and sister nations that were outside your, your tribal territory. And then in so doing, they would have gifts that weren't included in your territory. So they would share their gifts with you. Quick example, you can still in the LA basin find obsidian. Obsidian is being readily found in a lot of uh, uh, development sites and things of that sort showing this one material of volcanic glass that does not come from here. The closest place we can get obsidian is up north uh, uh, in you know Mammoth, or you can out go towards east towards Blythe, or you can even go down south towards Salton Sea, but nowhere in the LA basin is there natural volcanic activity to produce this obsidian. However, still in the year 2021, we're discovering obsidian all over the place showing just how much these resources were moved within our landscape. This sort of understanding of the value of these resources is what helped with the bonding of uh, the communities back in the day. And here's a typical picture of what a community would look like 
within one of these sheltered coves or one of these inland bays, uh, much like you know Newport Back Bay or even Anaheim Bay and Seal Beach or even you know Biona over in you know um, uh, up north in Marina del Rey. Um, all of these bays uh, provided for all this sustenance and all this ability to live a prolific life, a bountiful life on this landscape. You know, and, and uh, the folks that lived here, you know, the, the ancestors from our tribe, they lived here for thousands and thousands of years, thousands of human generations utilizing this landscape in harmony. And only in the last few decades, and in reality, it's only been decades, I wouldn't even say in the last century, but it has been about a century, but in the last few decades mainly, we have transformed our landscape in such a way that now we're not getting any benefits from it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is some of the uh, benefits that we're gonna receive. And first I wanted to describe just why we are called Keech. And Keech actually is the name for the home, for, for the, uh, uh, the dome style hut made of tule and grasses and willow. And that home helped to identify. Now, traditionally, you know, way back when, each uh, grouping, they didn't identify themselves as a general term. Uh, it was identified due to your uh, village site, where you uh, live. And so you would be such as um, a lot of our family comes from the village of Savangna. Uh, we would call, uh, we would be a Sibabit, where if you are from a location, you're saying that I am from, or uh, uh, the ending would be a BIT. Uh, if you uh, are going to that location, the ending would be NGA. So just like today, if we're from Los Angeles, you're saying I'm going to Los Angeles, but I'm an Angelino. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Los Angeles, I'm an Angelino. So back in the day, you would say I'm going to Savannah, but I'm Sivavit. I'm a person of Savannah. So that sort of uh, uh, identity is how it was related back then. But today uh, we use a regional um, understanding because the Southern Indians, as well as the Kawiya, the Eastern Indians, they used to call us Kisianos or Kichianos. Um, and then when the Spanish arrived, they called us Quechariños. So they use this word of the Kich, which is the dome style hut. That's how we were recognized as a term. So that's what we use today for our term Keech. We would love to spell it K-I-T-C or K-E-E-C-H, but unfortunately it was a German ethnographer who first wrote about you know, our folks here and he used the German phonetic Z-H to make the ch sound. So now we're, we're uh, uh, left utilizing the K-I-Z-H uh, spelling for, for our tribe. But this dome style hut, this is what I wanna talk about because this hut, Folks, you know, international folks identified us from this, even surrounding uh, nations identified us by this because of its uniqueness. A dome is the strongest geometric fit or geometric structure we can create. That's why our capitals are made out of domes. That's why, you know, a lot of our important buildings have domes in them. Well, domes cannot just be created out of anything. These domes were created into large structures. You could actually have whole groups in there and, and have community uh, ideas, but it all came from the ability of willow. And here's what I wanna talk, because willow is one of our main trees that identifies us. It's one of our main symbols for who we are. And it's actually the main symbol for our women, for the females within our tribe, because willow bends, but never breaks. And that's the strength, that's the tenacity that's still within our families. And that ability of being able to bend and not break allows for that uh, strength and allows for that structure to be formed. Well, now Willow not only provided that, I mean, Willow provided for granaries, Willow provides for insect repellent, Willow provides for uh, a slew of useful compounds. And it also provides for our medicine, for pain, for inflammation, for anything that you would use aspirin for, even heart uh, issues. Willow is a very, very important plant to show us, and here's where the teaching comes in. So, willow, the, the genus of willow 
is salix. Willow with salix, our bodies as humans, we actually do not recognize salix if we were to ingest it, if we were to take it in. But that was the standard way it was taken. You take a little branch, you chew on it, and you would then get these medicinal healing compounds in you. But check this out. Our body does not recognize those compounds. Therefore, we actually need the help of a foreign critter, something that's not even our own DNA, to help us in that translation of that compound. And here's where I'm going at. Inside our bodies lives a whole separate little genome, a whole separate little critter. And these little critters, there's actually two of them, they're called probiotics. And these probiotics made of yeast, made of bacteria, they do recognize salix, or salicin, I should say. Um, salicin is the main compound. That's what comes from salix. Salix is the genus. Salicin uh, is not recognizable. What ends up happening is that these little gut flora, the, the probiotics, they do recognize salicin. So what they do is they then take that salicin, they repackage it into a compound called saliginin. Then saliginin is recognizable by our body. So then our body then takes that saliginin, and it repackages and it metabolizes it into our liver as salicylic acid. And now, I don't know if any of you uh, uh, have been looking at some of the ingredients in a lot of our medicines, but salicylic acid is very common within our aspirin. You can see it as acetyl salicylic acid. That's just the uh, uh, turned around form of it. That's more easier on your tummy. Um, also within wart removers, salicylic acid is the main ingredient. And so these components, because this compound is antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal, which is why it's working for warts. And so these compounds, and also salicyl salicylic acid right now is being used heavily in the cosmetic industry because salicylic acid actually works on your cell. Because when, for actually like young kids and stuff, when they're going through acne, <clears throat> A lot of times uh, skin cells end up uh, congealing and they start uh, getting into your pores. And that's what causes the blackheads and the whiteheads and all that stuff. They, they pretty much stuff up the pores. So salicylic acid actually helps to unbind all that dead, you know, white, dead cells, dead skin cells, and helps to remove it so that your skin then becomes a lot better. So that's uh, one of the components where salicylic acid is being used in the cosmetic industry. But here's the main component. So you, we hear all these benefits from it. But remember I said, our body would not recognize salicin. So we needed the help of a whole nother critter. And here's where the learning comes in. If we do stuff by ourselves, we get no benefits. We need help. We need each other in order to get the benefits. In order for us to get benefits from this tree, we actually need the help of these probiotics for that process. So in life, if we try and do stuff ourselves, we get very little benefits. But if we do stuff together, working as a community in tandem with each other, we get all these benefits. And that's what our trees are trying to teach us in this mechanism that goes on all the time. If you were to take a a willow leaf and or a branch and you're chewing on it this mechanism is happening inside of us we're getting the help at that time but we don't even notice it we don't pay attention to it but these are the lessons being taught to us hey guys you need some help let's work together and so elderberry elderberry is one of our other very important trees elderberry it's 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 a very, um, it's, it's our music tree because we actually make our flutes out of it, our clapper sticks. Um, a lot of our uh, percussion uh, comes out of this tree. Well, elderberry also has heavy, heavy medicine. And this is something that, and I'm explaining all of these uh, mechanisms and these functions to you because I'm gonna uh, explain how we can use these at the end. But elderberry, let's just take this guy, for instance, by planting elderberry in our communities, we are now, providing this medicinal power that is gonna help us during our pandemic time right now with COVID. Uh, this plant has already been proven to be able to fight against viruses. 
And the main guy that it's been tested or studied with is the flu virus. And this guy is, is able to be able to combat the flu virus, not just in its inception, but when it's even the most powerful, when it's, you know, it's raging in your body, there's compounds within Sambucus that help to attack it at that level. A lot of our plants have to be there first and they have to get, you know, your body's immunity going and stuff. But this one actually has compounds that take control. These are like special forces kind of compounds that come in there and just take, you know, knock out what they need to knock out, but they don't kill everything. Like a, a lot of our Western medicine, when we take it, it just kills everything because it doesn't know how to be specific. But our plants, they do. And so you can see some of this, you know, literature that I've wrote up here. Uh, these uh, compounds are very, very useful in our combativeness of all these new little pathogens that are coming into our world now, that are coming into our daily lives. And so here's our other one that, now this one's not a tree. I put this in here because this is my favorite one. I just wanted to let you guys know about it. Yerba Santa, this was given the name Yerba Santa from the Spanish because the Spanish named it that as the holy herb because they actually put this plant into their pharmacopoeia for their whole country of Spain. They had like a list of, I think, um, five different plants that they uh, took from uh, America. And this one plant was the top one that they used in Spain. They exported it from here and used it in Spain because when their folks came over, they were bringing diseases with them. And one of the main diseases was tuberculosis, a respiratory disease. So we, our tribe, we utilize this plant right now for COVID uh, protection um, because this plant has antibacterial, antiviral, all these antimicrobial compounds to help so much so that the Spanish crown back in the you know, 1700s even identified this plant so powerful, they gave it the name sacred herb and included it in their own country's pharmacopoeia of medicines that they use for their own people. So this is a super powerful plant, but check this out. This one, Ariodictyon crassifolium, that's the, the scientific name of this plant. It contains all this stuff. But in the 60s, the FDA came in and said, hey guys, we gotta start having all these clinical trials. We gotta start doing all this, you know, um, uh, 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 process, this, this formal process in order to identify, you know, useful plants or I mean, useful compounds. And guess what? Nobody, and to this date, this is still true, no clinical trials have been performed with the Aerodictyon plant. However, it was the main plant used not only by the United States, by many international or countries for these respiratory ailments. So today with the respiratory ailments that we're having right now with our pandemic, why isn't anyone looking into Aerodictyon? We actually are using that for our own families and it's been very effective. We're using Aerodictyon and we're using Artemisia douglasiana. Very effective compounds to help cleanse your respiratory system uh, from all these invaders that are coming in to our world right now. And so I wanted to share with you also, uh, you know, I'm not speaking just, you know, out of my side of my mouth. This is actual uh, academic literature because what I do, I was fortunate that I got to go to school for biology. I got my uh, bachelor's and master's in biology, mainly ornithology. I'm, I'm a bird guy, um, but plants are, are an interest of mine as well. And so my uncle would always uh, teach me about, you know, which plants use this and which plants, you know, you can use for that. And I'm just like, well, why do we use them that way? You know, why are they used in this form? And so that's where my little scientific mind, I go into Google Scholar and I look up all the academic literature that helps to show. And, and here's the reality. What I'm finding is that academia is barely scratching the surface on the traditional ecological knowledge that all of our tribes had in-house, you know, and fortunately our tribe still has, I'm not gonna say all of it, but we have some of it still carried down. And here's um, one of the, the main concepts. And now science is helping to explain this. And I'm gonna explain just real quick, some of the in vitro anti-cancer activity of one of our main ones, Lucia odorata. This is also called marsh flea bane. Um, we call it sweet leaf. This is a, a water plant that we use right now. We've actually used it on many of our uh, members for you know, anti-inflammation 
and actually for cancer components as well, because here's what this plant does. And this article, you can write down the, uh, um, the, uh, the information. You can look this up on Google. It's readily available on Google. But um, this article explains how the compounds that are within our native plants, they are able to find cancer in your body. They're able to stop the cancer from replicating. And then they're able to program that uh, cell into apoptosis if it can't be repaired. And let me just back up just real quick to explain all those uh, features, because that is an amazing capacity for our plants to actually be able to find cancer cells. Now, here's the reality. Our plants aren't looking for cancer cells. That's not what they're, they're uh, 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 geared to do. What they're geared to do is our plants and our trees, um, all these uh, medicinal compounds, they look for an abnormal within a normal. So just like that Sesame Street song, one of these is not like the other. That's exactly what our plants are doing. So check this out. Check out how our plants find cancer in our bodies. This one mechanism, uh, uh, Plutea odorata has a high affinity towards cholesterol binding proteins. Okay, what does that mean? Check this out. Cancer cells on their cell membrane have a high concentration of cholesterol binding proteins. So therefore, through natural affinity, these plant compounds are gonna find that abnormal cell, the cell that has that high concentration. And that cell happens to be a cancer cell because it's different. It's abnormal. That's what, our, our, that's what these phytochemicals look for because when they look for the abnormal, they're saying, hey, I'm here to fix it. So then cancer cells, one of their main things is that they replicate, replicate, replicate. They make more. That's what tumors are. Well, then this plant says, hey, I found somebody that's different. I got to see what's going on. So then they end up having other compounds that help to stabilize microtubules. What, what does that mean? Our cells all have a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made up of all these microtubules that hold it together. For mitosis to happen, the cytoskeleton has to break. So those microtubules have to break and then they form two new cells. These plants stabilize the microtubules, meaning they're frozen, they can't break. So now you've identified it, you've stabilized it, now you go into the repair process. And so these plants have these repair mechanisms. If this cell cannot be repaired, then it goes one step further. And this is the remarkable part because all our cells just don't die. They have to actually be programmed to die. And that's a process called apoptosis. Our plants are able to do that. So if the cell has been found, it's found that it's not able to be repaired, it's been slowed down. Now, boom, it goes into apoptosis and it goes away. These are the functions that are out there within our, the, the constituents within our plants that are readily found. These are uh, compounds called monoterpenoids. These are things like camphor, menthol, eucalyptol, all of these compounds that are plentiful in, in all of our native flora that science is barely, and here's some more, barely talking about. Here's some of the, here's what I was just talking about, the monoterpenoids, the eucalyptol, the camphor, the carine, the menthodienol. Um, all of these compounds, they actually help in the whole pain component. And uh, that's a whole nother concept, but I've got to keep moving. Then we go into another component. Now we work a lot with uh, um, local groups. Uh, one of the groups we've been working with is the LA Food Council. Um, we also work with state parks, we're with the county parks, um, and we're trying to promote or uh, just provide them with this idea that humans have been fed by this landscape for thousands of years. Yet today, in our generation, we have something called food insecurity. We, all, we always called it starvation back in the day, or, or you know, you're, you're, you're starving, but today we call it food insecurity. And that food insecurity is because we have to import all our food into LA when there's plenty of food available in our landscape, but we don't use it. Um, here's a, a, a quote from Father Junipero Serra, which wrote that, you know, they found vines of large size and in some cases quite loaded with grapes. And I could get into that story. That's actually what made 
Father Junipero Serra, very famous with the Spanish crown, is the grapes because he made wine and brandy. And both those he shipped back to the to Spain and Queen Victoria loved the wine that came from here. And so that was that's why you'll see in Cucamonga all along our foothills, we had uh, vineyards all over. That was our plantation. We were the plantation workers for the vineyards. That was our plantation. Um, we were the laborers. We were the, the, the ranch hands. We were the, the nannies, the coach drivers. That, that was uh, how actually our tribe survived through the Holocaust of the missions. Because the missions, when you were brought in there, you were, you were pretty much decimated with disease. Um, and then, you know, up to whatever they wanted. So a lot of folks did die. Our personal tribe, we were able to survive and exist because we were the ranch hands and all these little, um, what they call like satellite kind of located. They're all the ranchos where the Spanish uh, military, they were given, and this is part of our family story. I wish my cousin was here to explain our family story. Um, but we are part of the Perez Nietos family, which were two Spanish soldiers that came here with Portola and they managed the San Juan Capistrano mission and the San Gabriel mission. Well, they had mistresses. Those mistresses have led to uh, 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 members of our tribe. And because of that, we also carry that Spanish line. And that Spanish line are these high um, uh, uh, influential uh, Spanish folks where uh, Juan Perez Nietos and, and I mean Juan Crispin Perez Nietos and Manuel Perez Nietos, they both received the largest land grant of Alta California, 360,000 acres. And so our family, you know, became part of there. And then when the Mexicans came in, we uh, were part of that whole, the pobladores that came in from uh, Sonora. And then when the Americans came in, uh, B.D. Wilson, who was one of the main BIA, he was the third county supervisor. He was the mayor of Los Angeles. We were his ranch hands. He took over land that was part of our family. And so we became his servants. And he was actually the grandfather of General George S. Patton. And General George S. Patton, my uncle, our chief, lived with General George S. Patton at the Huntington Library when he was a small child because our family were their caretakers. Um, so that's how our tribe survived through all these generations of Holocaust is that we were the servants. So we were useful folks. So we were kept alive. Um, anyway, that was just a side story. Um, but regarding foods, um, things that, that now, you know, wheat flour replaces seed or, or grain. This is a huge concept because now we're getting celiac disease. We're getting all these allergies associated with this one plant, wheat, that is not the main source of food for our bodies. And so a lot of us are getting, our bodies are rejecting it. And we're now getting all these different you know, ailments from the foods that we're eating because of the processing that has to go on with today's foods. So by changing from the natural foods to these processed foods, you see we're all getting cancer. I mean, even the Alzheimer's, I wonder about that. Like why so many of our, I don't remember that when I was younger that all my older folks always got Alzheimer's. But today it's like everyone when they're past 75, that's what's, anyway, that's a side thing as well. But some of the health benefits that we can get are just numerous. However, we're creating all these restoration lands and we're just doing it for the birds and the bees and not even considering how humans can benefit from it. And so just one example, chia, this is one of my favorite plants, um, just all the components. And, and this guy, I give this as an example because you can make easy chia pudding where if you like tapioca pudding or rice pudding, think about this, tapioca and rice, they're, they're a carbohydrate, they're a simple carbohydrate. If you replace that one ingredient with chia, which does the same kind of uh, mechani mechanism in terms of uh, uh, absorbing liquid, Chia will be able to absorb the liquid, absorb the flavors, have the same mouthfeel, the same kind of velvetiness as tapioca, as rice, and same flavor. However, by changing it to a seed, you are now incorporating a living capsule of life. And this living capsule of life has in it the linolenic acid, the, the magnesium, the phosphorus, all these components that our cells want to heal themselves. So by instituting this one natural ingredient, you are now fortifying your body with all these essential vitamins and nutrients that would not be coming from a simple starch, being the, the, star, the um, rice or the uh, uh, tapioca. So it's, it's ideas like this, and we can grow this in these locations. We can harvest it and provide it to our communities 
in our restoration sites, but we don't do that. Today's land managers just create a restoration site and then look at it as just, oh, look at what we did. We'll put a little trail through it and we'll put little you know, boards up to tell what these plants are, but no way are we gonna use them. And that's <clears throat> the big concept change that we're, because I love food. And there are so many beautiful uh, components about food that will, oh my goodness, we are missing out on the flavors that come from our landscape. And that's another thing, but I have a, a few more slides that I wanna get to um, because here's the other thing about food that is very important. I show this picture because I wanna show the community of what's going on right now. You see that the ladies are there you know, creating the meal, you see some of the kids surrounding them. This is the reality of our food. And this is why I, I want to bring this back. We are doing it within our own tribe, but I wanna bring it back into our culture because into the main community culture, here's what happens with our food. All our food needed to be processed. When you need to process it, you have to uh, uh, spend time. You have to, you know, be together and show how it's done. This was all the bonding time that occurred. Think about when we have Thanksgiving or when we have Christmas. All the time we're spending together is in the kitchen, when you're cooking the food, when you're preparing the food. That's what needed to go on every day. So that's why in our community, we had a lot of bonding time because you had to spend time preparing the food. And so that reality is what's not, not there anymore. Even today, I mean, when we have food, we don't even sit at the table together with each other to eat our food. You know, it's, it's that sort of concept, let alone prepare it together. You know, it's that sort of rushed mentality that we live today that is separating us and is just making us so that our community is more like this rather than like this. And we used to always be like this. And so that's one concept that, you know, with our food, that's one of the benefits that it teaches us is this community bonding. Now, I also want to get into another subject because we can get medicine, we can get food, we can get shelter, but check this out. We also use our native trees as beacons. And this is something that uh, Amelia and I, I, I just kind of brought it up to Amelia and she's like, whoa, this is something you should bring up to the whole, you know, to everyone at, at the workshop. I said, okay, um, this is a recent find that our tribe uh, uh, was just involved in um, a few years ago. And we actually told the city of LA about this. And of course they uh, said, yeah, right. There's, there's no such thing as, as oral history or a tribe in LA, um, even though we are recognized by the state, we are recognized. Anyway, that's a whole side story. They didn't believe us. They continued with their project and they uncovered human remains. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up. At this location, and you can see Here's my uncle um, at the reburial ceremony, and you can see him sitting down on the right, and you can see the location of where this burial was, where the construction staff are. They're in the middle of the street, right in front of Deja Vu Showgirls. So who would think that there's a Native American burial ground right in front of this urbanized area? That's the reality. Our landscape has only been capped over. We have not removed all the thousands of years of human occupation on this landscape. We've simply built on top of it. So now that we're going back in, we are all within these areas. So this particular area, we had a, a consultation years before this project started, two years before this project started. And we explained to them about the sycamore, about how this was the location where the sycamore existed. And that, let me go back. You can see these are pictures from 1880 and 1885. Why did we use sycamore? Now we have two old growth trees. Now, the reason we use sycamore is this identified our burial ground. And the reason we use sycamore is because we have two old growth trees. We have oak and sycamore. Oak, when it grows, it creates a canopy. So when you're looking on the horizon, you see a straight line, a canopy. When sycamore grows, boom, it shoots up. It's like a beacon, as you can see in these photos. When you're on this landscape and you're coming from afar, you can see that location. And this is what the purpose of it was. The, the sycamore, oh, am I, the sycamore allowed for 
<coughs> this location to be found. Now, at this location, and we explained to them how the burials that were there were very, very uh, 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 powerful spiritual folks because that wasn't just a regular cemetery. It was like the Arlington Cemetery where high powered shamans. And so uh, chiefs, as far as Yuma, Arizona would come to that location to, to, to pray and to have ceremony there. Why? They weren't praying to the tree. They weren't praying to, uh, they were praying because the energy that is from these, these very powerful ancient folks was still in that ground and it still is today, which is why we're protective of it. This is an item that was found in that burial that shows this significance. This is called the Tamet stone. This is what's known as a, um, a, 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 an artifact that only comes from us, a type artifact, that's what I'm trying to think of. You can see that these were beads and you can see the size of it on the left and you can see on the right how big they were. They were like little grains of rice. And these components were um, a very powerful symbols of our religion, Tamet meaning the sun. And unfortunately, I think I'm running out of time here. So uh, they actually put a plaque there. You can go there today. It's right off of Commercial Street, uh, right south of the 101. Um, just look for Deja Vu Showgirls, and it's right across the street. Um, but uh, I have so much more I want to talk to you guys about. Um, I'm so sorry I, I kind of uh, uh, ran out of time. But there is so much. But the main concept that I want to share with you is that we have to use our plants and animals. They too were given the breath of life. And so we are part of them. We are not separated from them. The European concept is that you dominate, you gotta tame the wild. That is not appropriate for our landscape. You do not need to tame our landscape. You need to work with our landscape so that it will provide for you and benefit for you. So I thank you so much everyone for everyone's time and, and for letting me just have this time to to uh, uh, explain a little bit about you know, uh, our viewpoint of, of, of our flora and fauna, especially our trees. And I can go in more about trees of how important they are, but I know I'm out of time. I thank you so much.